Welcome to the Healthy Heart Show with Dr. Jack Wolfson, board certified cardiologist. And on my show today, I've got just a, a super interesting guy that I met, I don't know, about uh, maybe a year, year and a half ago. I was on his podcast and he's really done some tremendous things. And he is first and foremost, uh, you know, Luke, your, your, your podcasts are so entertaining, yet they're also very informative. So you really get that, that kind of infotainment type of podcast going and really it's, it's really been exciting. Now Luke is a former Hollywood celebrity fashion stylist and spent the last 21 years developing and refining the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of health and spirituality while at the same time embracing the technology and modern conveniences of urban living. And I think what's super cool as well is that you know you are like this, you're a biohacker, you're the, as you say, human research lab. And when I told my staff that I was gonna be interviewing you, they all just, you know, they think the world of you and the stuff that you're doing. And, and, and one of my girls said, uh, you know, Luke's story has just done it all. He's tried it all. So I, I said, you know what, I got to have him on my show and uh, let him share kind of, you know, his, his take on health and wellness and certainly how it pertains to, to heart health. I appreciate that. That's great, man. You're, you're really good at doing your intros. I always find it <laughs> so interesting uh, to watch other podcasters do their thing. I, I would never trust myself to kind of do the show intro and the bio and stuff live. I always just start the interview and then uh, two months later I go back and like, you know, very carefully uh, kind of record the intro. It's great. Hats off to you. So yeah, man, life is good, Jack. Life is good since we last spoke. It's great to see you again here virtually on screen. And uh, yeah, I have tried it all, dude. And um, you know what? The stuff that works sticks and the stuff that doesn't, I just forget about. But I have found a lot of ways to, um, God, to just feel better and as a result, do better. Well, I mean, so back, you know, to that, I mean, like, what do you think are some of your favorite, you know, biohacks? Maybe tell me some of the stuff that you think works and some of the things that, uh, in your opinion, uh, you know, didn't work for you. Because as you know, I, I know you've spent a lot of time, money and effort on these biohacks as a lot of people have. And, uh, you know, once again, how do you, t you know, tell what works, what doesn't work? And then how do you kind of, yeah, you know, get through all that fluff. So all these people aren't spending, uh, you know, $10,000 on some kind of electronic device, you know, that really you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, isn't necessarily going to help. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, it's funny, and I'm, I'm glad you framed it that way because I always like to start with the very basics, which is just fundamentally getting our biology back in alignment with the principles of nature and the power of nature. And so it gets, you know, it starts very simple, and I'll, I'll start there, and then I'll go into the stratosphere of some devices that, sometimes I want to say are a bit extreme, um, not necessarily in practice, but in, in the cost, as you mentioned, where you're getting up five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars on some of these things. And, you know, it's funny because even at the highest level of the technology end of biohacking, all of those things are really either replacing something that's missing from our domesticated lifestyle and using, you know, magnetism or light and things like that to sort of reintegrate things that are missing in our in our current environment of industrialization and domestication or in some cases they're just amplifying uh, what's already there like in the case of PEMF or something like that it's like well those frequencies are already in existence on the planet it's just that there's so much um, there are so many frequencies like EMFs and things like that that are coming at us that didn't used to be there you know of course you studying the paleolithic uh, approach to life know that and so sometimes it can get expensive and extreme, but whether you're starting out with the free stuff, which I'll describe, or you're getting into the technologies, to me, the idea is the same. It's getting our bodies on a cellular level back into alignment and a biological level, energetic level, back into alignment with the planet. And, you know, we come from the planet. We're made of dirt. We're made of this earth and, um, and how we interact with our water and our light. Um, and the magnetism of the earth is is going to determine how healthy we are and the degree of pathology that we have. So uh, I'd said all that to say this, starting with the very basic, I'm thinking about like what's really had an impact on me. And I do, I do so much. All, I just came from an IV ozone uh, therapy right now. I, I realized I had the... Uh, the, um, the, you know, the um, bandage on my arm still, and I just took that off, you know, because it 
wasn't part of my outfit. That's always a good sign that someone's really hacking, you know, is that when they got Ivy pole, yeah, they're doing totally. podcasts, you know, with the Ivy pole, you know, that's there and all the bands. Yeah, totally. Some it's kind of device, ha- you know, ha- I mean, maybe they got like a violet shoved up their nose, you know, while they're, uh, you know, while they're doing the uh, interview, right? A lot of the time I do, I, you know, f- sometimes I joke like I should have a nurse practitioner kind of present when I'm doing interviews so I can have my stuff hooked up. But no, seriously, I just got back from that treatment. We can talk more about that later as a, you know, a little bit more of an extreme um, intervention. But I went outside just prior to our talk and I, um, I walked my dog and I get out there and I take my shirt off. I either go barefoot depending on the level of sanitation in my neighborhood. I don't walk barefoot, but I have some grounded uh, sandals that are called earth runners and they have a little copper mm-hmm. plug on the bottom and they have a, a conductive thread that goes into the strap. So anytime you're on a conductive surface, such as concrete or grass or dirt or anything, essentially that's not asphalt, I guess, or plastic or something, you're grounded. So I'm out there in the sun. I'm grounded to the planet as we have evolved to be. And unlike many modern humans, I'm not afraid of the sun. I worship the sun like a higher power. I mean, I think the sun is just so crucial. And so setting the intention to kind of get centered and and get myself grounded quite literally for this um, interview with you, I go out and I get sun in my eyes, not, you know, looking at the sun, obviously, but just open my eyes, not hiding from the sun, take my shirt off, get grounded. Um, Speaking of heart health, expressing the love that I have for my dog and really getting into a heart-based emotional state as I go outside and just feel gratitude for the chemtrail free day we have oddly enough i don't know why but um the skies are clear in la of natural phenomenon and otherwise and uh i'm just out there for maybe 10 minute quick walk Mm -hmm. and to me that's the basics of biohacking is i need to be out in nature i need to get that natural spectrum of light not only in my eyes but on my body and the grounding so sun exposure and grounding are two uh major ways that i have upgraded my health over the years um, and let's just include in, in the free um, nature-based uh, based approaches is breath work of whatever kind. So, you know, when I was on my way to and from my ozone therapy today, <laughs> I'm, I'm working on something called deuterium depletion at the moment. And part of that protocol is you have a little mask that you, you breathe. And so it's, it trains you to breathe deeply and slowly and in essence helps your body to deplete deuterium. And so... I'm, I'm breathing all the way out on my drive to West LA from Miracle Mile where I live, which is about a 30 minute drive at this time of day. And I'm really just paying attention to my breath and I'm getting that oxygen. And then there's more aggressive breath work that I do. I do holotropic breathing. I do Kundalini yoga. I'm currently in teacher training for Kundalini yoga. And one of my favorite parts of that is this breath work. I've been doing that for seven years and doing breath work classes and courses and things like that. And then lo and behold, a couple of years ago, I hear about this guy, Wim Hof. And I go, wow, I love breath work. I love ice baths. And, you know, it turns out <laughs> I did three of his trainings. I'm about to do another. Um, he's doing wow. a tour. I'm going to do another workshop out here. And I go, this is Kundalini yoga. You know, yogis have been doing this breath work for thousands of years. I, I can, I, you know, pretty much I can do like any kind of biohack, but I've never really gotten into the uh, cold therapy yet. I remember as a kid, you know, in Chicago, first of all, I, I really didn't like the cold, especially as I got older. And then we used to go to a party every year and, and it was a Swedish household that had the party and they had the sauna and oddly enough they were like cooking sausages in the sauna and i was a kid and everybody else was drinking champagne it wasn't some kind of healthy party and right. i was there you know because this guy was a partner of uh, of my father's but then they had the cold plunge afterwards and yeah it's so big in the scandinavian cultures that kind of cold you know bath i me personally i just i, I don't know how do you, how do you get in how do you train yourself to get into the uh, uh you know cryotherapy mindset yeah sure so Part part of it is, you know, in the in the Wim Hof tradition that he's kind of created. I guess I'm assuming taking from other traditions, the breath work is a big part of it. So you become highly oxygenated, right? And when you're full of oxygen, you have this sort of metabolic power that enables you to overcome the tendency for your nervous system to go into a fight or flight panic mode when it's threatened. And a big threat to your nervous system is being in freezing water. <laughs> so that that's one method. But I don't really, personally, I don't really, generally speaking, associate the breath work with cold water exposure. Um, how I 
worked my way up was from doing what used to be called um, contrast showers back in the 90s. Uh, and then, you know, it comes out of hydrotherapy where you're exposing yourself to hot and cold, hot and cold and, and going back and forth. And I've been doing that since I was a little kid in hot springs, you know, in Colorado where my dad lived and then jumping out into the snow and things like that. And then getting into the contrast showers um, primarily because I had back pain and it would really help my back to just kind of pulse the blood in and out with that contraction mm. and expansion that comes from hot and cold contrast. And then lo and behold, you know, all these years later, I, I just ended up just not really turning on the hot water. I just don't, I just like taking cold showers. And then, and then going back again to uh, the Kundalini Yoga, one of the first things they teach you in Kundalini Yoga is to take cold showers every day and don't even, don't even bother with the hot water. Wow. Thought, oh, that's so interesting. You know, so many of these practices, they're not, they're not biohacks that came out and, you know. 2010 or whatever there these are ancient practices that human beings have figured out to be uh, very uplifting and to have health benefits and even benefits in raising one's consciousness so what i recommend for someone that has a really hard time with you know cryo or doing ice baths is just start out doing a hot shower and then turn the water all the way cold for as long as you can stand it which might be 10 seconds 30 seconds and then go back to hot and start with that contrast and what you'll find is that as you start to master your nervous system and see, you kind of can trick your nervous system and your mind into knowing that it's going to get that hot water again. Mm -hmm. So even if you're dying in the cold water, you're like, all right, 10 seconds, 10, 9, 8, and you count down. You're like, you know you have control of it, and you can turn the hot water back. And then over time, what tends to happen is that uh, you don't really need the hot water so much, and you get so used to that invigorating feeling of the cold shower then to go in and do an ice bath or a polar plunge in a frozen lake or river or something like that um, it's just a natural progression because you really do build up this nervous system endurance i mean I, I think of it as like a nerve force or a nerve strength i don't know if there's science to back that up but right i just feel like i can withstand a lot of discomfort and partial partially that's due to the fact that i've been acclimating myself to being in really cold water for extended periods of time for a really long time whereas now I mean, the other day I was at the Russian spa here in, in um, West Hollywood. It's called Voda Spa. It's a, it's a great, really nice high-end spa. And they have a nice cold plunge. It's probably, I don't know, I want to say under 35 degrees, like a proper cold plunge and really hot Russian sauna that's fire heated. They have these big furnaces and, you know, it's really nice heat. You guys have all the best toys out in L.A., man. It's, it's uh, incredible. Yeah, well, you know what else? At every street corner there's something, you know, and, and in fact, I was – um. Uh, I was speaking out uh, in LA and I got off the plane and the first thing I did, I went to Erewhon grocery store and hung out nice. there and just looked around there were the coolest things. And I went to Korean right. cafe, uh, you know, LA, if, if you want to be healthy yet at the same time, if you want to find a lot of sickness, uh, yeah. it's not, it's not so, not so difficult to find. I've been, Jack, I've been here for 30 years living in, in, in the center of LA and I'm, I, you know, I'm struggling with the, um, with the noise pollution yeah. and I'm just finding myself, I just, I want to get out of the city more and more. So I'm, I'm actually working on moving at least to the outskirts a bit, but one of the horrendous things we've got going on here is they're rolling out 5g. They're starting actually this month, October, 2018, and they're acting like they're just doing it. But if you drive anywhere through Malibu or the Malibu canyons, there's 5g um, antennas just everywhere and almost wow. like um, it's almost like it's i want to say every fourth or fifth power line they'll yeah. be one of those so it's just like i'm like oh my god not to be a tinfoil hat person but the level of emf and noise pollution and stuff like that here it's like you you pay the price to have access to a lot of these um, benefits i mean but that's all you know it's all in the literature it's all in the literature certainly noise pollution is linked to just about every cardiovascular risk every cancer risk is linked to noise pollution so that's you know wow, i know i know I you know say it, and yes it's not tinfoil hat stuff noise pollution and atrial fibrillation hypertension cardiomyopathy um, you know, but, uh, and then you, you know, I, I know, you know, the same people I do and PhDs, you know, like Martin Paul, uh, you know, up in Washington. I mean, these guys, you know, men and women are PhDs are writing articles on what, on what, you know, 4G did and how, how damaging 5G is going to be. And, um, it's, it's definitely very scary. I mean, we're electrical beings, our brain, when you do an EEG or an EKG of the heart, that's all electricity. Why would you think that that's not going to play some catastrophic role? And it's and I'll tell you one more thing, yeah. Luke. You know, our our kids, we had them enrolled um, at a school, at a preschool, and 
we found out that the flagpole was a cell phone tower and we oh, only knew that because That's they were horrible. they were taken down the flagpole to put up a faux palm tree and uh, that was the first that we thought of it and it was just like oh I mean, these God. people stop at nothing and they put it right on a on a preschool on their on their lawn so yeah man i i i understand that yeah there's some great things in la and i mean you know the food it's like every other you know place is an organic juice bar and organic grocery stores and restaurants but um, yeah, at the end of the day, that noise, the light pollution, and then, like you yeah. said, five G. Wow, weren't they yeah, it's um, it's 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 discouraging to say the least. So uh, yeah, it's weird because I, you know, this is where I, I've worked here for thirty years. I used to be, as you said, in the entertainment industry. So I, I, I didn't have the freedom to move, or I would have had to get get a new career. And I don't have any education. I don't have any skills other than that at the time. And so uh, you know, I was kind of stuck here. Now, thankfully. A lot of my work is done online and traveling to speak and things like that. So I have a little more flexibility and, that, and that's why I'm setting the intention just to at least get out of the center of the city. But I wanted to, I wanted to wrap up um, for people the, you know, the, the, the free or relatively inexpensive biohack. So beyond the, um, you know, the ability to go do you know, cold plunges and ice baths and things like that, um, Oh, I know what I was saying was at the, <laughs> at the Voda Spa, just to give people some encouragement. You know, when I was there the other night, there was an older guy, maybe a little, I'm 40, I about turned 48. He's a little older than me, probably early 50s. And he had all these young bucks with him sitting around the ice bath and they were doing breath work and stuff. And they were getting, you know, he's training these kids to learn how to do the cold plunge. And I was like, oh, that's cool. You guys doing some breath work? They said, yeah, yeah. And then just to mess with them, I went and sat in the cold plunge and just totally relaxed and calm and just started having a conversation, you know, just to freak these That's kids hilarious. out and show them like, hey, man, it's mind over matter, you know, it's like you can do the breath work and you can do all that stuff. But honestly, with the cold plunge and getting yourself used to that, um, you know, whether it's cry or whatever, so much of it is in your mind. Yeah. As you said, growing up in Chicago, you know, I lived in really cold climates, maybe not that cold as a kid in Idaho, Colorado. And I hated the cold, but it was really just a mental construct of me having a belief that I hate the cold, it hurts, it sucks. When in fact, like once I get in an ice bath, once I get through that first 10 seconds or so of kind of like <gasps> having to regulate my breath, I just, I relax and I just like meditate in there and it feels wow. so good. It just, I, to me, it's like a high. It's not even, it's not even hard after the first few seconds. Um, so there's that. I just want to wrap up that piece that it's something that's so good for you that I don't think any human being should be without. And I'll add to that, not only the cold therapy, but the hot therapy. You know, I have right behind me here, yeah, you can see in, in the videos, um, I have a clear light infrared sauna. I've had an infrared sauna for yeah, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And um, the way I look at it, again, going back to evolutionary human life, we've, unless you lived by the equator, you never lived at 68, 70 degrees your whole life. Like there was always going to be fluctuation. And even if you did live in an area close to the equator, you were often subjected to extreme heat, maybe not the cold, but you definitely got a little fluctuation. But where we've migrated to on the planet, natural humans have been really hot, then really cold, then really hot, then really cold. And I think that we've lost a lot of the resilience that we would normally have by being afraid of sweating, by being afraid of the sun, afraid of getting hot, afraid of getting cold, um, to the point where you know many people still believe the propaganda that the sun kills you, when in fact it's sunscreen and sunglasses that'll kill you. It's a little deeper conversation, but it's like, why are we afraid of nature? And nature's the thing that has given us life. Um, well, you know, and, and I think you know you also made a good point, just as far as uh, you know, it, this stuff need not be expensive either. You know, certainly yeah. cold, you know, cold therapy. You know, you can put ice into your own tub and do the you know the, the hot cold shower alternating. You know, and there's no cost to that, and putting ice in your tub and going out and getting sunshine and walking standing barefoot. Uh, all these all these things need not be overly expensive. And, you know, it's kind of like hashtag no excuses, you know, so yeah, you yeah. save up your money for, you know, for your organic food. And, you know, what? I'd, I'd rather pay $2.50 for an organic avocado than 75 cents for a non-organic. But, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can do these things. Uh, and and you know, obviously, you know, the, the form of yoga that you practice, uh, that stuff can all be found online, right? You can probably do some yeah. YouTube videos and boom, there it is. You don't even have to go yeah. to some kind of studio to practice it. Uh, well, yeah, you, you, you nailed it when you said hashtag no excuses. And I don't say this is a blanket, um, you know, 
a blanket uh, label for everyone, but I do find from doing my podcast and I have a Facebook group for the listeners of the show and um, a lot of the feedback I get is like, oh, that's good for you and the people that have money, but I don't have any money, so I can't do this stuff. And I think a lot of the time, it's, it's not only just limiting beliefs about whether or not you have the capacity to have abundance in, in a monetary sense, because I think that's really just a mind thing too, but it's that people don't want to do stuff that's good for them because it's kind of hard. Yeah, it's not easy at first to get in an ice bath or you know, to go kind of figure out how to get sun exposure safely or do breath work or whatever it is, it's work. I mean, when I start a breath work session, I hate it for the first wow. minute or so. I mean, it's like, oh, it's like going to the gym when you first get on the treadmill or try and push some weight. It's like, for me at least, it's like, oh, this sucks. God, why, did, why am I here? And then 10 minutes into it, you kind of get pumped up and you're like, oh, this kicks ass. And then that, that willingness hits you, you know, and you, hit, you get over that threshold of um, resistance and I think it's the resistance that prevents people from really doing some of these interventions more so than it is the money. Because they'll still bitch about, you know, oh, I, don't, I, can't, I can't go in the sun because I'll get sunburned. I can't do the breath work because whatever. I can't do ice baths because I don't like cold. It's like, well, there's a difference between whether you can't do something or whether you won't do something. Right. There's all there's because you know, there's always some kind of excuse. So if they if they they either bring up the financial excuse or the next best excuse, of course, is I don't have time. It's great for you, Luke. You've got all the time in the world to do all this, but I don't have time to go outside for ten minutes and take off my shirt and walk stand barefoot, or I don't got time to take a cold shower. Uh, you know, it's um, you know, and I know this, you know, because when I demo with patients and I talk about kind of you know, and I'm certainly no expert by any means, but just the, you know, mindful breathing. And I like to show people like, you know, alternate nostril breathing oh, and, yeah. and doing those techniques. And I tell you, Luke, I demo that for like 30 seconds to my patients. And after the 30 seconds, I feel like a million bucks. I feel so good, even from that, like that short little burst. And then every single time I tell it to my patients, I'm like, wow, I feel so much better. Don't you, <laughs> you know, uh, and I have them do it with me. And it's like, hey, they're coming out to Arizona for, you know, for a nice consultation, you know, with Jack Wolfson and he's doing these alternate nostril breathing things. But that's the stuff that works. That's the stuff yeah, that works. It, it really is. And there's, to me, it's like, I, you know, I tend to be a bit on the woo-woo side, admittedly. I'm, I'm very interested in the metaphysical realm of life. Um, but the funny thing is about things like, you know, doing the alternate nostril breathing or what some people call box breathing or in the military, they call it combat breath, you know. <clears throat> it all does the same thing. It calms your nervous system. And again, these yogis going back thousands of years, they were just probably sitting in a cave in the Himalayas going, huh, I wonder what I could do to change my consciousness. <laughs> you know, it's like they're fucking bored, you know, <laughs> and their, their intention was to raise consciousness. So they start working with the energy systems of their environment and of the body. And it's amazing what something like some alternate nostril breathing can do for you. Yeah. You do it for one minute, even 60 yeah. seconds. It literally rewires your brain. It's crazy. So there, there are so many interventions that are free. Uh, the last one I'd like to, to give, and this isn't so much going to, necessarily change your mood in the immediate sense but is the the blue light issue you mentioned light pollution living in a city and you can get some cheap ass blue blockers they're not the best but you can get some blue blockers on amazon for eight dollars and if you put those on every night when the sun goes down or what i did in my home is i just i have a daytime set of light bulbs and a nighttime set of light bulbs wow. and I, I just got some um, like decorative party bulbs, these amber or even red, in some cases, incandescent bulbs. So they, I don't like LED because of the flicker rate. Again, not in, the sun doesn't flicker. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. So incandescent bulbs don't, I don't know if they flicker less or not at all, but definitely way less than an LED or fluorescent bulb. So I just, I do my best um, to not be exposed to artificial blue or what appears to be light, um, white light at night after dark so it's just i become habituated oh it's getting dark that's nice i'll try to do a little sun gazing if i can see that last 10 minutes of the sun looking about 45 degrees lower than the sun and if anyone tries sun gazing please do it safely google it research it don't just go out and stare at the sun mm -hmm. but again an ancient practice that has a, a lot of uh, um, uh validation from science having to do with all kinds of geeky photons of light and things I don't quite understand, but I know it makes me feel good. But then I know when I come back inside, oh, it's dark outside, so it's going to be dark inside. 
meaning that I don't have that spectrum of light that the sun emits midday when it's midnight and I'm kind of a night owl. So I've, <laughs> I've, I've hacked my iPhone so I know how to turn it red. I mean, all my computers, all my devices, everything has that blue light blocked and <clears throat> that's something you can do for relatively low um, budget but has a huge impact on your melatonin and as a result the rest of your hormones and neurotransmitters and things like that so it's like if you have anxiety and depression it's probably because your melatonin and cortisol cycles your circadian rhythm is backwards which mine tends to be if i don't pay attention to that lighting so so i mean, so, I, mean not, not years, that expensive. I mean over the years i mean as you're kind of like this um you know hollywood you know fashion uh you know consultant and designer and stylist so I mean, I, invariably, those people stay up later. That whole lifestyle, they stay up later. And I think, obviously, that leads to uh, sickness. That leads to drug abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, prescription drug abuse. It leads to suicide. Have you, I mean, have you changed your time frame as far as when you go to sleep? I know you said you're, you know, you're a night owl, and I think I mentioned this to you last time, that owls are night owls. We're not night owls. Yeah. Yet, at the same time, I did read a book recently uh, called Why We Sleep. And in there, he talks about the studies that are on people that, um, you know, that some people do naturally, that if you, um, uh, you know, if you look at their circadian rhythms, they do stay up later naturally than other people. So as me, Jack Wolfson, cardiologist, I would say, hey, everybody go to sleep with the sun down and wake with the sunrise. There may be some genetic variation in that as well. But yeah, so, where, so where are you at now as far as what time does Luke Story go to bed? <laughs> right now i'm so pissed to admit that my average is probably i go to sleep between 12 and 1 a.m did you hear that listeners all over uh, instagram and facebook live yeah. story 12 okay and, 12 I'm, and i'm not proud of that and i don't recommend that but it's um, probably better than what it used to be right tell, tell me you used to oh, go to sleep God, right? probably mean, like three four i mean when I, used to, when I oh when i used to play, i used to play in bands and stuff you know yeah. throughout the, the 90s and half of the 2000s and uh yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'd go to bed three or four in the morning and I mean, especially earlier in life when I was partying and just kind of in sure. the underbelly of Hollywood nightlife and stuff. Um, yeah, definitely way worse. But still, I tell you, man, if I can just get to bed and get to sleep at 11, yeah. the next day I feel like I'm freaking 18 years old. <laughs> I mean, the, the difference it makes for me between, you know, going to sleep at 11 or one is huge. And it's, it's one of these things I just, I, to be honest, I really struggle with because Every night I set the intention, I'm like, all right, tonight, 10 o'clock, I'm going to start winding down. I'm going to be in bed, ready to turn the lights out at 11. And literally every night I, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then next thing you know, it's midnight and I'm, start, and I'm getting in bed at midnight. And then it's kind of one by the time I unwind and read a little bit and do my thing. And it's just, it's a really hard habit for me to break <clears throat> because I just get a lot of energy at night. And it's like late at night, my phone stops buzzing. You know, people stop emailing. It's like, a lot of people, I think, find that solitude in the morning and people that get up at five or six and they can kind of like introduce themselves to the world before people start coming at them. For yeah, me, it's like yeah. I find that time at night. I know after 10, no one's going to bug me and I can kind of have that time to myself. And so I use those precious hours, which would be the best, most restful sleep probably to just kind of unwind from my day. And so I don't know what the solution is exactly, but I'm, I'm working on it. Now I have done a lot to improve my sleep and it's I mean my sleep is pretty good most of the time based on the tracking that I do for it and things like that so there's been a huge improvement but in terms of the time frame when I sleep it's not really gotten that much better in a few years it's very rare that I will get to bed at you know at 10 or 11 it's usually like midnight I kind of sound the alarm like all right Lou get your ass in bed yeah <clears throat> but it, yeah. it's tough man I, I do I really struggle with that so, so what, uh, I mean, what are some of the maybe things you have spent your money on, the things that have worked for you, you know, most recently that, uh, you know, maybe worth, you know, a few bucks to, you know, to the average person to go out and get, uh, you know, get for their, their biohacks? Sure. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of great stuff. Um, you know, people always like, if you had to buy one thing that was like a few hundred or a few thousand dollars, what would it be? It's, it's, it's tough. Like if I had to get rid of everything I own, that's, you know, technology wise for biohacking. I'd have to say, like, if I had to pick one number one thing, if you said, Luke, you can only have one device that you plug in that's for your health, it'd probably be my clear light sauna behind yeah. me. Um, I think there's just, there's so much data, there's so much research, there's so much anecdotal proof just within my own practice that it, it's just, it just said, 
so supportive of my health and in so many ways. Um, so the sauna is a huge one. You have to be careful though, because a lot of them are really high EMF. There's a lot of saunas that are um, manufactured and marketed to be a health product, but have a lot of negative effects due to the EMF and things like that. So um, my sauna definitely. And then I think that probably the, the second one would be, and this depends on how ill you are too, um, things could change. My recommendation would change a little bit depending on the level of pathology and what's going on with someone. But my all-time favorite device so far is something called an amp coil. That's A-M-P-C-O-I-L, amp coil. And the amp coil uses a combination of different um, modalities in one device. It uses biofeedback. So it indicates to you where the stressors are in your body through a voice analysis um, program. Uh, and then the biofeedback sends frequencies into your body that resonate either with pathogens and metals and molds. And um, it's actually designed for Lyme disease. That's its mm -hmm. main application. So <clears throat> there's things in your body, co-infections, things like that, that resonate at a certain frequency. And you can send very specific frequencies into your body with the amp coil. And what's interesting about it is similar to Rife technology, mm -hmm, R-I-F-E. Mm -hmm. Some people may have heard of that. Sure. With Rife technology, it, it has an application, but it's not strong enough to penetrate through the blood-brain barrier and through the hollow organs. So Rife will kind of neutralize some um, pathogens, but it'll also just piss some of them off wow. <laughs> and okay. put them into survival mode. So what's unique about the amp coil is it, it has the – frequencies in the app which is in a tablet just like an android tablet and you can set whatever frequencies you want to play they're all they're all embedded within the app but it's delivered through a magnetic coil so it's a pemf delivery of frequencies or sound or vibration so you can use it to cleanse and get rid of things like whatever lime is we're not even really sure it's a number of different things and co-infections but it treats well i don't you know, they, it's not a medical device, so the terminology they use isn't treat or cures, but sure, sure. Say, it's, it's very successful at alleviating the symptoms of Lyme disease. And that's why well, I mean, I, I think, you know, you know, you also, you mentioned, you know, the word mold in there and so many people have mold exposure, mold exposure in their history. Uh, you know, I see it from a cardiology standpoint, the amount of mold, uh, you know, that, that, that you know, the, the havoc that it can wreak and people don't even know that they have it. And then we send out a mold inspector to their house and they've got plenty of mold that's there and some people are really uber sensitive you know to it i think that you yeah. know you know when you talk about you know this device to you know to use frequency therapy to go after mold uh yeah i think uh, i think that's a, actually a, a great tip yeah so that's that's kind of the the mac daddy if i could, if i could only you know the sauna is good but it's just more of a lifestyle integrated yeah. thing it's, it's not so much like a, a powerful intervention like the amp coil so so uh, where do you find the amp coil oh they sell it on their site it's yeah. uh they have two models one of them's eighty five hundred dollars one of them's ten thousand they have a newer one that's more compact and travel friendly uh that's ten thousand but again that sounds drastic to some people but if you do a payment plan it's like one of those things where you're going to, you pay the farmer or you pay the doctor. You right. know? It's like, right. that right. sounds like a lot, but if you look into later on getting dialysis, getting chemo, um, you know, ruining your health, trying to treat Lyme with antibiotics, which doesn't work, but it's like when you get into, you know, the late stage interventions of yeah. Western yeah. medicine and allopathic models, it's like, you want to talk about expensive. So well, you know, I mean, obviously, from my standpoint, I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've seen about thirty-five thousand patients, and wow. you know, so many times, uh, yeah, I, I shouldn't be so proud of it, right? But you know, so many, there's just so much sickness out there. But so many times, you're sitting across uh, either the table or you're looking down on somebody in a hospital bed, and you know, you can just tell that they've got these strange, oddball symptoms that the medical community has no idea what they are, but the person feels lousy and they're labeled with some kind of psych disorder. And I'm sure when you go to that person, that person may be willing to look into the amp coil. You know, for those of us that, you know, that, uh, hey, you know, I feel great. My numbers look really good. I eat healthy. I get the sun. I get the sleep. You know, we're, we're probably not talking to that person, but if you're yeah. out there and you're looking for answers, I, I wonder if there's also some, maybe some medical clinics that also have the amp coil uh, and yeah. things that are similar to it for, for people to try. There, there are practitioners, you know, it hasn't been my personal kind of business model to use my amp coil to treat people. It's, sure. it's tough because sometimes people hit me up and they're like, Hey, I have Lyme. I'm really sick. <laughs> 
can you help yeah. me? And I'm like, ah, I just, you know, I don't have an off. It's out of my yeah. house, you know? So it's like, I don't know if I want to open up kind of a public type clinic sure. in my house. It's sure. not really practical, but there are, there are a lot of practitioners now that own devices like the amp coil that you can go mm -hmm. see. And, you know, you just, it's like you go into the chiropractor, you pay a, probably a one to $200 fee or something like that. And I'll tell you what, I'll just say straight up based on my research, if anyone's um, struggling with Lyme disease specifically, I've never heard of or seen the type of results that people get with the amp coil. Wow. It was just at their summit uh, in, um, in Lake Tahoe. It's my second year there. And I heard on stage from at least, I wasn't in the room all the time, so I want to be accurate about this, but I heard from at least five people from the stage, hey, my life was de devastated by Lyme for X amount of years. I didn't do anything but get this device, and now I don't have any symptoms. And I personally have met many, many people wow. that use it for that. So, and, and this was a Lyme yeah. conference? Um, no, it's just the it's it's the Amp Coil Summit. It's okay. for users and practitioners and owners and people that have Lyme or just people that are curious about learning about its applications. And most of the people there, you know, some autoimmune and just random sort of bizarre illnesses, but most of the people there have used it for Lyme. So mm -hmm. when I saw that last year when I went to the first one, I was just like, oh my god! And that's why I got involved with it. And um, I actually just dropped one off at my mom's house in Northern California to treat her Lyme, which she's had for 20 years. So wow. I've got her just started on a protocol right now. And that's going to be the true test. It's like not someone I met, but someone that I know and love. And, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful and confident that she's going to see some major improvements. So I'll be reporting back. Fantastic. Publicly, like, you know, after the first four months, six months, like, hey, are we seeing improvements? That way I'll really, really know. But <clears throat> I'm not sick like that. But I used the amp coil just for, um, you know, uh, brain entrainment and meditation and things like that, because there's also frequencies that are just really calming to the nervous system that balance your chakras. I mean, I can put that amp coil on someone for about 20 minutes and put them in the deepest theta, restful, beautiful meditation place too. So it's got kind of a whole, mm, I, don't, I don't know if spiritual is the right word, but uh, definitely like you can use it also for consciousness applications. And that's what I use it for mostly. I do a little cleansing. I've got some parasites I'm working on and stuff. Mm. But it also just makes you feel really good. So, so that's probably my favorite one. I'll, I'll rattle off a couple other ones. Um, the Juve Red Light Therapy, photobiomodulation. I've got that panel across the room. I tried to put it on in a podcast once because it looks really cool, but it makes quite a lot of noise. So uh, uh, uh -huh. it's got a, kind of a loud fan. You'll pick it up on the mic. But the red light therapy, again, just studies out the yin-yang to prove its effectiveness. Uh, I use that mostly for energy, mitochondria, things like that. Uh, and then I've got another device called a Nano-V, which is really effective for reducing oxidative stress. It makes something called exclusion zone or EZ water, and you inhale this mist. It's more for performance. It's not so much um, kind of an anti-aging performance thing, mm -hmm. not so much for disease or something like that. Like well, I mean, I, th I think anything that charges up the, ex you know, the exclusion zone from a cardiac standpoint, right, that's what's lining all the blood vessels. So if you charge up the exclusion zone, and once again, for the people that don't know, you know, what it is, that's the work of, of uh, you know, Gerald Pollack and... And that exclusion zone is just the pure water that sits inside in one place is the blood vessel. And if you get that blood vessel nice and slick and you've got that large exclusion zone, you're not going to get blockages. You're not going to get disease there. So, um, yeah, big fan of anything that can charge up the EZ. Yeah, so the Nano V is is you know that one's a pricey one. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna warn people, but more, more price. Hold on, first we got <laughs> the sauna, we got the amp coil. Yeah. After we were just bragging about how cheap it is to be. We're up to we're up to that. thirty grand. But listen, yeah. man, what I always say is start with the free stuff, and if you're well healed, like yes. to me, see, I don't buy big screen TVs. I don't buy um, you know summer trips to the Mediterranean that are 20 grand. Like sure. I just, for me personally, I like experiences in nature that are relatively low key. I mean, I'm not like a full outdoorsman. I'm kind of a glamper, you know, right. right. But I, you know, I, I don't have, I like, I don't need a private jet. I don't want a Ferrari. I don't need that stuff. So it's just a matter of kind of what your interests are and where you put your money. I don't have kids, so I'm not saving for college funds. You know, it's just, any disposable income I have, I kind of invest in myself and in my health. And, so. and you know, the people that are driving the Ferrari, they never look healthy, right? It's always like some <laughs> overweight, like 65 year old man <laughs> who's trying to reclaim it, you know, you know, his yeah. uh, glory days, you know, when there, they got, there might uh, be some truth to that. Uh, what, one, uh, one, one other device, Jack, that I just want to give a shout out to that's been profound for me um, is the uh, vital reaction molecular hydrogen inhaler. 
Yep. So this is a little um, kind of, it looks like a little, it sort of looks like a, a Kangen water filter or something, you know, it's yay, 12 inches high, little white plasticky looking thing. It's a couple of, you know, I don't know, four, I think four to seven thousand dollars or something, depending on what unit you get. But it's a passive therapy, and you put in a cannula and you inhale this uh, hydrogen gas. I think the one I have is seven percent, which is about as high as you can go before it starts becoming flammable. But this molecular hydrogen, you can also take it in tablets, which yeah. is much yeah. cheaper, um, dissolves yeah. and, you know, creates a gas in it's water. It's not that much cheaper. The, the, I mean, the quality yeah. hydrogen <laughs> tablets, they, they add up as well. It's about 50 bucks a bottle or something. Because, like yeah, yeah, because we do that as well. But, uh, yeah, a excellent information. The molecular hydrogen, man, I mean, powerful, powerful antioxidant scavenger yeah. of, of just the free radicals that you want to scavenge. Um, also, incidentally, really a, a powerful protection for EMF. When that molecular hydrogen is in your body, especially if you combine it with uh, magnesium bicarbonate, you put that in your water. I don't know exactly how it works, but I have the data on it somewhere. But I did a podcast uh, with Tyler LeBaron, who's kind of the, you know, one of the most respected guys in um, in hydrogen. hydrogen sure. Yeah, he, he does talks with, um, you know, uh, Joe Mercola and people like that. He's the guy and he's yep. a super geek, super smart. And we did an hour show just on hydrogen. And Again, the studies, the data on the use of molecular hydrogen as a health intervention are so abundant. Uh, and it's one of those things that you feel right away, especially when you do the gas. Yep. Like you'll get up from a session that's about 15 minutes, depending on the device, and your vision will be clearer. You'll be able to think clearer. If you were a little groggy or brain foggy, that will be gone. So that's one that's like, it's fun to show people because it has such instantaneous results. So I think for the big guns, those are probably kind of my favorite right now. Right, right. Um, what about uh, uh, holistic dentistry? How, how, what are your options out there in LA and what are your thoughts? Uh, on t I, you know, I recently saw a fantastic documentary, if you haven't seen it, called The Root Cause. Oh, and, yeah, I did, yeah. And, and, and I'm, you know, the, the biggest laugh in the whole thing is when you see all the different therapies that this guy has done. It's, it's kind of like, you know, what this guy has done for biohacking himself, not for biohacking, really trying to get his health back. Yeah, uh, it really it, it was absolutely hilarious. But then getting down to that teeth and certainly as a cardiologist, I wrote a whole chapter on teeth in my book because it's so critical to, you know, to reclaim that good oral health. Well, this is one of those things that we just, you know, we believe the quote unquote authorities that you just go to any old dentist. And if you have a cavity, they just if they go, oh, you need a root canal, or you need a tooth pulled, you just do it. And a lot of people don't realize is you can get not can, but it's likely that if you don't go to a dentist that understands co um, not co-infections, but um, cavitations, which is what happens when you do a root canal or you pull a tooth, if there's any bacteria in that hole essentially that they've drilled out or pulled out, that bacteria gets into your jaw and you get an infection in your jaw. And then lo and behold, you start having heart problems. You start having all of these other seemingly um, unrelated, uh, you know, autoimmune type issues and things like that. So yeah, it's really, thank God I discovered, you know, holistic dentistry a long time ago. Um, God, I mean, a lot, a lot of years. So I had a couple cavitations due to root canals and, and an extraction, and I dealt with those probably 15 years ago or something and had my mercury fillings removed. But if people aren't going to a holistic dentist, it's not the dentist's fault. Again, it's just like, you know, it's not the, the fault of uh, you know, a Western med doc that sure. just wants to do surgery or prescribe something. It's just, that's their training, you know? Yeah. And so you go to your average little mini mall down the street. Oh, dentist. Great. I have, I think I have a cavity. Let me just go to any old dentist. They're just going to use the model that's now so outdated and just creates a lot of pathology, which has to do with just, they call it drill them and fill them. You know, it's just like bang, bang, bada boom, bada boom. Oh, cavity, yeah. drill that root canal, fill it up, pull your tooth and give you in many cases amalgam fillings, those metal fillings that uh, are, have a really high amount of mercury in them that's again going to leach into your system and eventually you know, you're gonna sprout all of these other, or could, not that you are guaranteed to, some people have mercury, they never have a problem, it depends on your methylation, but for most people having mercury inside your head is not a good thing and years later you start developing Alzheimer's or whatever it is and you don't make the correlation to the fact that you went to a dentist that just doesn't understand how your mouth affects the rest of your body. And I think also, you know, these dentists that have been doing it for so many years, you know, that's a pretty painful proposition or a painful pill to swallow or however you want to say it, that 
to, you know, to acknowledge the fact that, wait a second, I've been poisoning my patients for X amount of years. I mean, I look back on it and say, I was, you know, prescribing, uh, you know, statin drugs and blood pressure drugs and, uh, and aspirin and all these unnecessary pharmaceuticals and never addressing the cause. And, and, you know, I was able to admit that I was wrong, but for the average, you know, dentist to say, Oh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I've been doing, you know, I mean, I mean, a whole, a whole profession yeah. of, of, of dentistry is all about the root canal. You're not going to get those people to switch. And in fact, you know, the, the person who pulled my wisdom teeth that did not need to be pulled, I text a buddy of mine, because it was his father who did it. And I said, hey, ask your father if he removed the periodontal ligaments. And he said, no, he never did. And who cares anyways? That was his response. Like, oh, yeah. it, ju it just dissolves and it just goes, you know, somewhere. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. you know, that chronic inflammation, I mean, you know, all the cardiologists know that inflammation is bad. They just have no clue as to why we're inflamed. Right. Well, one thing I love about you, Jack, is you've you've saved your soul, man, and you you did a pivot in your career a, as a doctor and went, oh, whoa, there's some things I had wrong here, and it's it's difficult for a lot of people that have a, a high pedigree to do that. If somebody's highly educated, they they've got a great income, they've built a practice. I mean, I can imagine it's really difficult to go, oh, whoops, I have to tear down my whole model and kind of rebuild. Uh, you know, I don't think a lot of doctors are necessarily you know, morally, I'm mean, a lot are morally bankrupt and, and have yeah. the information and don't choose to change. So it is a, a bit of a moral issue, but it's just like not practical to probably just revamp your entire understanding of medicine and the human body and all that. So I, I you know, I applaud you for having the humility to say, Ooh, shit, oops, I, I might've hurt right. some people inadvertently. And now I'm going to spend my life being of service to people and educating them on the other side of the you know, preventative medicine and things like that and lifestyle and all that. So yeah. it's, it's encouraging to see doctors like you actually to come out and be like, Hey man, I'm switching teams. Like we don't, you don't have to uh, die of some um, disease. You could actually live into your elder years relatively healthy. <laughs> well, for any, any medical doctors that are listening to this, you know, feel free to contact me uh, and I'll, and I'll help you make that transition like I did, but I got to tell you, Luke, you know, I mean, I can count on, on one hand, the number of people, number of cardiologists who have contacted me over the years saying, Hey, I love what you're doing and I want to change and, and all five of those people, they made a phone call. We talked for a while. They sounded really into it. And then they just kind of like disappear. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it, it's definitely, it's sad. I mean, I know there's a lot of people in our space that are, are making that change and you know, it's, it's okay to, you know, to once again, to admit the guilt. My mom comes in from Las Vegas and she says, Jack, I was the worst mother in the world. I gave birth to you in a hospital. I fully vaccinated you. I didn't co-sleep with you. I put you in your own room with your own crib and I let you cry it out. And you cried. Oh, damn. And I let and I let you cry. And when you were crying, I would come into the room and throw chocolate chip cookies over the edge of the crib so you'd shut up. <laughs> and I say, Ma, you were a wonderful mother. You were a wonderful mother. You did what you did. That's what you knew. You've got your excuses, and that's okay. But if someone is to ask you now, Marlene Wolfson, the best way to do it, yeah, I should have done this. I should have done this. And once again, it's okay. You know, yeah, t you know, take your take your lumps now and move on. But you know, like you said, I mean, listen, for the cardiologists that are making you know upwards, you know, in the high six figures or in the million dollar range, you're not going to get those people you know, to, you know, to make any meaningful changes. I left a group of 40 cardiologists. Nobody listened to what I was saying. And I said, it's in our own literature, 2007 Journal of the American College of Cardiology. They're talking about intestinal hyperpermeability and congestive heart failure. And nobody cared <laughs> when I'm talking about yeah. leaky gut. Nobody cared. Well, there's, you know, there's smart doctors like you that also I think have, um, have an entrepreneurial bent and spirit and capacity where you've you know you're managing to create a brand and you have your products and you have your own thing it's like not everyone is capable of deviating and and out of the system and reinventing themselves you know i mean you got you and dr pompa and there's there's guys out there that are right mds that are like mm, yeah i'm just gonna make a new business so yeah i'm gonna lose a certain um lion's share of of, of revenue 
in right. my one business model, but you have the wherewithal to kind of morph into a new business model and start doing online classes or products or whatever you can, which is cool. And unfortunately, I think some people just don't have the aptitude to be able to do that. Even if they know what's right, it's like, well, God, what am I going to do? Yeah. How am I going to, you know, how am I going to pay the mortgage? I'm not willing to pivot in such a dramatic way in terms of my business model as a doctor, right? You know, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're both friends with uh, Joel Kahn and, um, you know, Joel is, you know, is a cardiologist in Detroit and he was, you know, him and I went through our, our natural cardiology training together with a few other cardiologists and, and the other ones, yeah, they just couldn't make the jump, even though they knew the truth. Uh, they just, like you said, maybe they don't have the entrepreneurial spirit or, or, or the capability really to do so, which is, uh, which is sad and it's, and it's unfortunate. But, uh, you know, for those that can, you know, make that switch, you know, I mean, the health revolution's on. I mean, listen, when people can go to, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, the Lifestylist podcast, Luke's story, and they're getting, you know, an infinite more health information than if they were going to their, you know, their cardiologist or whatever. I mean, you know, that's where, uh, you know, that's where, you know, the revolution's on. When people can go to the internet, they're hearing such great stuff, such great ideas and, uh, and reaping the benefits. So, yeah, I, I want to back up to the, the dental piece of it. Cause I feel like I, I left people hanging a little bit. What you want to look for is a biological dentist, someone that understands biological dentistry. Um, there's a guy named Hal Huggins, who's sort of the grandfather of that type of dentistry, and he trained dentists all over the world. So if you can find someone that follows the Hal Huggins sort of uh, methodology and protocol, you're going to be in presumably good hands. But that said, I go to about three or four different dentists, depending on what it is that I want to do, because it's interesting, like the biological guys, they might not be good at your bite. They mm -hmm. might not understand TMJ. And then you got a, you know, another one that understands the bite and the TMJ and you're getting the right night guard and stuff, but then they don't understand the cosmetics. And you got another guy that, that I got a great dentist here, Dr. Keen in LA, and he's great cosmetic. He does all the celebrities. I mean, I was in there a couple months ago and I walked by Shaka Khan, you know, and I was like, man, this is cool. <laughs> you know? ah, all right. I'm in the right dentist. But then he's like, cool. So we're going to put the fluoride in here and the, you know, yeah. the thing. yeah, what, these wisdom teeth, we should just pull those out. I'm like, no, 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 no. But if I have a chip or something like yeah. that, you yeah. know, or yeah. I want to, you know, do safe whitening or something like that. But it's it's interesting because if you if you if you shop around for dentists, say you have one problem, you'll get four or five different answers recommended from each dentist, even within the biological, you know, nor natural um, alternative dentistry. So I think it's important to kind of like shop around a little bit and follow your your heart on t in terms of. Um, who has the integrity and who has the competence. Right. You know, right. Having, and, having and, and I think like anything, you know, it's just, you know, you go meet the person uh, and if you like him, you stick with him. You like what they have to say. You like the program, the protocol. Uh, you know, then you stick with them. But from a financial standpoint, it's always a difficult proposition, you know, certainly telling people, hey, you know, thanks for coming out. We did this blood test. You got some supplements, get some sunshine, some sleep, eat organic food. And oh, by the way, this dentist you're going to go see has got like a $40,000 care plan uh, for your mouth. Right. So, I mean, I, I don't necessarily think everybody should go run and have their root canals removed. But at the same point, if you've kind of hit a wall where you're eating mostly, you know, on the right path and you're doing all these other lifestyle things and you're still in a rut or even maybe worse so your blood work really shows that your body is inflamed and you know you've got these lipopolysaccharides and you've got the autoimmune conditions and evidence of leaky gut and all that inflammation it's it's likely coming from your teeth so yeah, yeah you may have to yeah. you know ha have to you know fork over the cash to to get that done and it is it is a lot of money dude yeah. i just i just I, i've had a missing tooth from an extraction uh, for a long time and what happened was I, it was on the left side and I ground down my whole right side. So my right teeth are basically destroyed, uh, unfortunately. And I was waiting for, uh, I didn't want to put titanium in my jaw. I don't want metals in my body. It's a long conversation, but agreed, it's a, agreed, agreed, agreed. It's, agreed. it's, uh -huh. energe it's an energetic, uh, thing, you know, acupuncture system, that kind of thing. So I was waiting for the zirconia ones to come out, and I thought it was going to be a really long time. Turns out they've been out for years, yeah. and I waited way yeah. too long. But yeah. I just finally got it, and I, I think I dropped like seven grand, dude, on this, you know. On that one tooth. tooth. 
Yeah, and so yeah. now I can I can chew on the left side, which is nice. But I'm like, man, it was it was not cheap. It was well, of, that's the point, really, of you know, of of those that are listening, as far as you know how, how you know what you do with your children, and really the importance of dental health, and really stressing that in like the next generation, because those of us that uh, you know we're eating uh, you know McDonald's cookies and cupcakes uh, and milkshakes and uh, you know uh, Mountain Dew and Coca Cola on and on and on when we were kids. Um, you know, it's uh, you know try, trying to save the next generation. But, you know, by teaching them these things to save in those teeth, man, you got to do that, you know, yeah. you know, real early. And, if, you know, yeah. anybody who's listening to I mean, one of the first books I read when going natural was uh, Nutrition and Physical De uh, Degeneration by Weston A. Price. Right. And Weston A. Price was a dentist in the 1920s traveling around the world with his wife by boat. And they came across all these native societies with people with beautiful dentition and amazing health. And as much as we can get back to that, uh, the better. So, you know, I was, I was actually thinking about that yesterday. I was doing a little journaling about um, just what I'm looking for in a, in a partner, a romantic partner. Like, what are the qualities in a woman that I would want to be with and potentially marry and have a long relationship with? It's just uh, another sort of uh, vision exercise. And one of the categories that I was looking at was physical attributes. It's not the most important one to me at all. It's more about. Well, well, I, I can only imagine, sir, you know, the, your list was obviously like very long. You got all these like different yeah. boxes, like uh, hasn't had a flu shot recently. Right. Doesn't fast food. And, right. Well, what's funny is when I was doing the physical ones, one of the first things that comes to mind is like straight teeth. Yeah. And I was like, why, you know, why would that matter? Like, you know, some guys might say, oh, I want, you know, this type of, you know, whatever, other body parts to be how they like them. For me, like the straight teeth and having like good white, big, you know, smile is it's that Weston Price thing. I think it's biologically, I want to, my, my genes want to procreate and mate with a healthy female species and not to, you know, downgrade a woman into a, a species, but purely from a, you know, evolutionary standpoint, I think you're looking for those teeth because that is the true sign of health, right? And that speaks to Weston Price. When you see those pictures he took of these people with these, these indigenous people with these huge, just beautifully spaced teeth. Yeah. And they're, they're just bright white and they have these massive smiles. And that's kind of the smiles that make Hollywood movie stars famous, you know, or at least their face. They have that Hollywood smile and it really, it does come from, um, it comes from the uh, living that lifestyle and not being domesticated and um, by the industrial revolution of our, of our food and our environment. So it's funny. It's something I, I look at in people. I look at their teeth and when they're all jacked up, I go, oh man, there's, there's bad genes going back a few generations, you know? Yeah. And, and a lot of sickness, a lot of ill health, a lot of autoimmune and stuff like that. What, um, uh, I, you and I could talk all day long. I love listening. I love listening to all these hacks and stuff like that. And most importantly, I, you know, I just, you know, once again, I, I feel like you and I are brothers, really in the sense that, you know, we, we both came from like this other lifestyle and we were able to come over onto this side. Like so many of us meet, um, you know, people that were like born into this, like, oh yeah, you know, my father and mother were both chiropractors or my mom was a nutritionist and I grew right. up, you know, eating all these, you know, incredible foods. Like I didn't, I grew up eating poison, uh, you know, if you will, and I'm not blaming <laughs> yeah. anybody, you know, yeah. but I know, you know, you're, you know, you're, you know, you know, upbringing was somewhat similar. So I, I applaud yeah. everything you're doing. Uh, you know, certainly what, um, uh, what's next for, you know, obviously the, your website is lukestory.com and that's S T O R E Y. Yeah. Uh, yes. your, your first, your website is beautiful. I love everything you did kind of like with your podcast and the imagery and everything. It's fantastic. Thanks, um, man. what, uh, and I know you got a health coaching, uh, you know, program you do coaching as well. So and tell me what's going on with you next. Well, first off, I want to say I knew we were kindred spirits when you sent me your book and I read your book. And, you know, I, I like the way your book's put together because it's very digestible. But literally, like, everything you recommended lifestyle-wise and diet-wise, I was like, yeah, I do that. I do that. I do that. I just went through the whole thing. I was like, yeah, this is my life. So we definitely and, and are. And it's also just common sense, right? I mean, you know, we're not trying to, like, reinvent anything. It's just, you know, and, you know, doctors have lost all common sense. But, um yeah, well, I, I appreciate your approach because it's it's powerful, but also simple and easy to understand. And that's the kind of messaging that I resonate with personally, sure. and I do my best to transmit. So yeah, LukeStory.com is my site. And you mentioned coaching. I was doing that for about the first year of having my podcast, which incidentally is called The Lifestylist. And I found it a little bit difficult to keep up with um, you know the number of people and to be able to devote the time needed. So I stopped doing that. And, and in lieu of doing 
one-on-one -on -one coaching. Now I'm doing workshops and retreats and speaking engagements and things like that. So I did a little bit of a, a, a pivot there in terms of the, the business model, I guess you could say, or how I reach people and help people. Well, I mean, obviously, I mean, if all people did was just listen to your podcast and all the guests you have on there that are absolutely spectacular, the information that's there, it's uh, it, it's revolutionary. I love it. I know my staff loves listening to you. and they'll Oh, be, that's great. You know, you know in, in fact, they wanted to come in the room, you know, for the interview and stuff like that. I'm like, you know, I'm going to put the headphones on so the sound is real clear. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. you won't be able to enjoy, but you'll have to listen to the uh, to the replay of uh, oh, Luke and I cool. talking. Well, I, I recorded it on my Instagram live so they can go watch that if they want. But I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, it's dude it's really it's fun to be able to discover experts in in health and spirituality and um you know because i think they're equally important and hand in hand and my job is almost like a journalist or a reporter or a translator or maybe a mix of all three where i can take super geeky science you know related people and translate their message into something that's uh understandable and applicable by regular people and then i can take very esoteric sort of out there spiritual ideas and concepts and, and make them relatable, I think is, is what my intention is. And I seem to be able to do the cool thing is, is I'm the conduit for all that information. So I'm sure as you discover, as you do your podcast, I just, I'm constantly learning so much. Sure. It's like, I'm just, I'm in graduate school just every day, just like absorbing so many great principles and practices. So it's just a gift to be able to do what I do. I love doing my podcast and the rest of it all. All right. Well, thank you so much, Luke, for being on the Healthy Heart Show. And uh, I look forward to talking to you and hopefully seeing you again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for having me, dude. You got it, bro.